Even if you have never played the Fallout series, there is a high likelihood that you know of the Deathclaw, as it is one of the most recognisable creatures in the games. They are usually some of the most deadly and toughest enemies the players can fight in the games, and will almost always put up a good fight before they go down. That's all well and good, but if given the chance, could a single Deathclaw change the entire fate of the Commonwealth? Well, I guess that's what we're going to find out, as today we ponder the question, can you beat Fallout 4 as a Deathclaw? First things first, we're going to need some mods if we want this to work, as funny enough, the game doesn't let you just become a Deathclaw, as far as I know. The mod that we'll be using is the aptly named Playable Deathclaw mod by Dummybot. I am playing this on my Series X, so as far as I can tell, this mod is available on all platforms. I will even leave a link to the PC version in the description. Dummybot also recommends a separate mod to edit the third person camera, which you can see the name of on screen now. Again, there will be a link in the description for the PC version. Now, with all that out of the way, let's begin. Things were not off to the best start as trying to begin a new save kept crashing the game. Thankfully, I have a save right at the vault exit and loading that just seemed to work fine. Now, to actually become a Deathclaw I need to craft an item at a chemistry station, so for the moment, I'm still human. I'm not sure if your stats actually matter all that much as I know some things change once you become the Deathclaw, so just for the fun of it I maxed out my charisma. Why? Because the idea of an incredibly smooth talking Deathclaw amuses me. Out of the vault and I just ran straight for the chemistry station and sanctuary and crafted the Deathclaw item. The mod also comes with items to turn into other Deathclaw variants such as Legendary and Gator Claws, but for the sake of the video we're just going to stick with your run of the mill Deathclaw. As expected the third person camera is a little broken, but thanks to the camera mod I can use the Pip-Boy and edit different settings to my liking. What I find worked best for me were as follows. Combat camera settings were X at 0, Y at minus 60, and Z at either 55 or 60. Then for the camera while sheathed, X and Z were both set at plus 60 and everything else I just left at their defaults. With the camera all set up I took a moment to mess around with the different attacks I had, and to give credit where credit is due, the mod creator did a really great job mapping all the various attacks animations to different buttons on the controller. Basically everything you see a Deathclaw do in game you can now do as well. If I was to compare the controls to anything I'd say it's pretty similar to playing as the werewolf in Skyrim. After I got used to the controls I went and spoke with Codsworth which, while amusing, at least confirms that I can in fact talk to other NPCs, otherwise this would be a very short video. Making my way for the plot and it's nice to see that my travel time is going to be cut down substantially giving my new running speed. Time for my first combat encounter and I couldn't think of anywhere more fitting than Conquered. I even pretend to jump out of the sewers just like the other Deathclaw. As you might expect all of the raiders go down with a single claw swipe each. I even managed to use the insta kill grab takedown on one of them. While the encounter was short, I learned something incredibly important from it. While I may have the defense and health of a Deathclaw, my limbs still cripple just as easily as a human. That, coupled with the fact I have a bigger frame, means suffering from concussions and broken bones is going to be a lot more common. After the raiders were finished and Preston decided having a Deathclaw come to his was a good idea, I leveled up and took the cannibal perk as it seemed like a fitting first choice. Well, turns out I couldn't have picked a worse perk as activating on any of the nearby corpses caused the game to softlock as I just stood still and couldn't do anything but load another save. I had a feeling there would be a fair few issues like this going into the run, so I've been quick saving quite frequently so I don't lose any progress. Entering the museum is simple enough as I can enter first person mode to open most doors. As for getting through doorways that I am now towering over, if I just run into them and then spin around while still holding the direction of the door, I can kind of just pop through them with no issue. This allowed me to make my way to the top of the building with relative ease. I tried to use vats once I was up there, but as expected it didn't work. Not to worry, nothing a few slashes can solve. After that was over with I talked to Preston and Sturges, being as polite as ever, and they made my way to the roof, and once more my curiosity got the better of me, so I saved the game, entered the suit of power armour, and here's what happened. Don't really know what I was expecting to be honest. But regardless, on the next attempt I just leave the armour and minigun, make my way back down to the street level, and once more, slap around some raiders for the fun of it. But then things get more interesting as it became a deathclaw battle. We were somewhat evenly matched at first. While I seemed to have the advantage in terms of damage and health, he was able to stunlock me pretty easily with each of his attacks. Lucky for me he stopped his swiping and I was able to land a heavy run attack to knock him off balance for a second, that I then followed up with a right claw strike that caused him to pop like a balloon. After that victory I slapped a nearby car until it exploded, for some reason, and then began to head back to Preston when I noticed something interesting. I appear to have a built in health regen as a deathclaw. I even checked my perks to make sure I didn't have something there that I hadn't noticed, but no, it was just part of the mod. 
So after seeing this, I added two more rules to the challenge. I decided I would not be allowed to heal by any other means in the health regeneration, and more importantly, the difficulty would now be set to very hard to keep things interesting. I then proceeded to grab my reward from Preston, offered to help, and then abruptly left to go towards Drumlin Diner for some easy experience. When I arrived, I put those charisma points to good use by threatening Wolfgang to hand over all of his money, and once he did, I killed him anyway because I'm a wild animal. Who really knows what I'm going to do next? Sadly, the door to the diner is too small for even the spin glitch to work, so retrieving my reward was an impossibility. I wasn't going to let that get me down, however, and decided to continue working with Preston and the Minutemen, as that seemed like the best choice for me in this playthrough. On my way to probably scare the life out of everyone at Tampines Bluff, I made a quick pit stop to help out Sully Mathis, although not before haggling my way for a few extra caps. To my shock, swimming actually sort of works. I was honestly expecting just to sink like a big scaly rock. After the valves are fixed, I very easily pop some crabs and then offer my services to the settlers in need of help. You may think that sending a death claw to clear out a group of raiders is overkill, and you would be correct. For the most part. Just like in Conquer, these are still early game raiders, and I am still in fact, ripping them to bits. What I was not prepared for, however, was the turrets. They actually do a surprising amount of damage to me in a short time frame, and to make matters worse, sometimes when they are shooting me, for whatever reason, I can't fight back. In the room with Jared, they actually get the better of me on two occasions, which I certainly was not expecting. On my third try, I just made sure to run for them first, which definitely worked out better. That said, they were still able to whittle down a good portion of my health. I then took out Jared, and right as I was about to leave, I stubbed my toe on a car, and died. Alright, attempt number four, and I just repeated my steps from the previous attempt, except this time, after Jared goes down, I make sure to stand back from any and all cars while dealing with the stragglers. Not much to say about those that were left after this, other than I find out fall damage is still fairly lethal as I jumped off the Corvega plant, breaking both of my legs, and then having to watch as I pathetically crawl to safety. Once my limbs heal, I travel back and inform Preston of the good news, become the first ever Deathclaw General, and then proceed to Oberlin Station for the next settlement quest. All they need is for me to kill Clutch in the back street of Peril, which is simple enough. On the return trip, I did get into a minor disagreement with some missionaries who broke me by beating me with bull cues. They weren't as fortunate the second time though. You may have noticed I just breezed right past the second Minuteman quest, and there's a good reason for that. It's because it broke. And I don't just mean this quest, I mean the entire Minuteman questline. I couldn't tell the people at Oberlin Station about the mission's success, no matter what I did or how many times I loaded back. Logically, I thought I would just kill them and get another quest from Preston, as I have done this before in a previous video. Not this time though, as when I approach Preston, my only option is to bring him along as a follower, and even if I do, he won't acknowledge my failures and give me a new quest. It's a little disappointing, but as of right now I still have the Brotherhood and Railroad as options, so with that in mind, it's off to Cambridge Police Station. As ghouls are just squishier people, I am quite literally able to bat them around with my tail without a care in the world. Despite the fact he's part of the Brotherhood, Dance doesn't seem all that fussed about my presence, which is nice of him. I offer to help of course, and the two of us set off the Archjet to find the Deep Range Transmitter. I'm not sure if the raiders we approached were brave or stupid, as they tried to fight a Deathclaw and his Brotherhood of Steel pet. After they were out of the picture, I went to pet some nearby dogs before we arrived at Arcjet. Spinning my way through the doors went just as well as Museum of Freedom. That was until I reached the room where you come across your first batch of synths. Breaking them down was no trouble. To be honest, Dance still did most of the work. The problem was proceeding from this point on. Rather than a normal doorway into the rest of the building, you instead have to make your way through this part of the wall that has been destroyed. The issue with this is the wall isn't as tall or wide as the rest of the doors I've been able to force my way through, and as such, I can't slip past. I was here for about 30 minutes acting like a Deathclaw shaped Beyblade, and didn't even come close to breaking through. I even tried first person mode to position myself better, but while it seems like you're normal height here, I am in fact still the same size and cannot make any progress. I even tried some of my power attacks as they have me dive forward, but yet again, nothing was working. So after being at this for a while, I figured that the Brotherhood might not be possible either, which of course just leaves the railroad, as I can't access the Institute until one of the other factions teleports me inside. Becoming increasingly worried I wouldn't be able to really start the main quest, let alone finish it, I began to head east past Diamond City and towards the Old North Church. For a brief distraction, I engaged in a monster battle with Swan to see who would come out on top. First try, and there's a little back and forth for a bit, but shockingly, he seems to have less startup on most of his strong attacks and AoE moves, which manages to knock me out of my own power attacks. Plus, not helping matters is that trying to back off and regen is a little difficult, because as soon as you're out of arm's reach, he will begin throwing rocks at you. At one point I realised that my normal right and left swipes were actually good enough to stun him, and if I circled around him while doing so, I could effectively keep him locked in place and pick up the kill. I figured this out too little too late sadly, as I was low on health and he was able to finish me off. Second attempt and I tried the new strategy and it works so well that I actually get him down to less than a fifth of his health before he's able to block one of my attacks. He is able to get a decent amount of damage in at this point, but considering a few more slashes for me is enough to put him down for the count, you can probably guess the fight does not last much longer after this point. 
After claiming the boat fragments as a trophy, I thought since I'm in the area, I may as well save Nick before heading to the church. This is where I made another run-ending discovery. The trigger men in small numbers are easy enough to dispatch, so that's not what I mean. But rather, getting past this turnstile is an impossibility. I can't jump over it as my head is pretty much already hitting the ceiling, and I can't walk through it because the death claw is just too thick. Just like an arc jet, I spent a while here just trying to think of ways to get past, maybe hoping to glitch through the wall and land down the subway station below, but sadly, that just never quite happened. In the end, it was impossible for me to get past this way. I even went and checked the exit where you and Nick would usually emerge from to see if I could enter from there, as I would buy it past the turnstile and be right outside the vault itself. But because the game doesn't want to make sense right now, that entrance just doesn't exist until you and Nick escape from the vault. With my mind completely blank on how to proceed as the story cannot progress until Nick is saved, I travelled back to Sanctuary where I crafted the item that would allow me to turn back into a human to allow me to get past, effectively feeling the run of my eyes. Regardless, I still want to see this through to the end, as when else am I going to get to play as a Deathclaw in Fallout 4? I decided to go back to Archjet first as if I'm using this to squeeze through small doorways, I may as well finish up this quest and join the Brotherhood. For what it's worth, I only turn into a human to get through this part of the destroyed wall, and once I'm through, I turn back into a Deathclaw and go to spinning through every other door that the game will let me. After I 360 my way to the basement, I spawn outside the map, which was initially concerning, but thankfully getting sucked into the void just places me back at the door so it all works out. Rather than burning him alive for once, I put my increased strength to use and actually help Dan's fight off the synths, allowing him to keep his artificial skin for another day. Riding the elevator is a little jittery, but thankfully nothing that breaks the game again. Wiping out the final room is simple enough, and once I fetch the transmitter like a good dog, we leave the facility, Dance gives me a weapon I will never use, and I join the Brotherhood. With that out of the way, it's back to Park Street Station, where I once more become a real boy, albeit briefly, before switching back to my true form and engaging in an oddly tough fight with the Triggerman. The would-be gangsters are smarter than they look, as they know to immediately cripple one of my legs to slow me down. Granted, they don't manage to kill me, and I'm able to hobble my way behind some storage crates until my limbs decide to stop jutting from my skin, and I can continue on with the slaughter. Once I'm alone, I activate the vault door, which is looking awfully cursed this time around, before going inside and throwing one of the triggermen through the ceiling and into a different dimension. You may have noticed the camera seems to be pulled back a bit more than it was before, making it much easier to see the Deathclaw. To be honest, I am not sure exactly why this happened. It may have something to do with the two mods clashing with one another, as this only happens after I switch to the human form and back. Honestly, I like it better, so I'm hoping it sticks. Making it to Nick, I have absolutely zero time for Dino, and just kind of toss him aside like he's nothing. I then have a brief chat with Nick before rip and tearing my way back to the entrance of the vault. I would like to point out I don't have the bloody mess perk, my power attacks just have this added effect of turning people into mincemeat. Ignoring all those points in charisma, I opt to still fight my way past Skinny and this man. Darla turned out to be my biggest problem, as one swing from her bat was enough to stagger me for a considerable amount of time. Luckily, if I activate one of the takedowns, I can't be hurt while the animation plays out, and in fact, I actually gain health as the regen is still active. Speaking of the takedowns, just like when you're human, they go straight through anybody else's block, so I'm able to use it on Darla as I proceed to pick her up and slam her spaghetti noodling body into the vault floor. Now that the exit exists in our realm of reality, me and Nick escape, and it's off to Diamond City to find Sean. Arriving in town, I decide to actually go through with Piper's interview. I have no intentions on bringing her along as a follower, by the way, but given the circumstances, I thought I'd be nice and help her out. After all, how often does she get to interview a Deathclaw? Getting into Valentine's office was a little difficult given the cramped doorway, but I was able to persevere and just about activate the prompt for the door after spinning to win. Inside, I also find out what happens when I sit down in a chair. The answer? I curl up on the floor like a dog and merge with all the nearby furniture. Once I finished my second set of questions for the day, I head over to Kellogg's and I actually forgot to pickpocket the key for once. No matter, one quick elevator ride later and I decide to flex my charm once again and instead convince the mayor for the keys for a change. I say convince, but it's probably more intimidating. After searching Kellu's house, things continue much the same way as they normally would as I venture towards Fort Hagen. On the way, I came across my first group of super mutants, and for some reason I had it in my head that I'd be able to tank the explosion from the suicider, but as I am on very hard, you can probably figure out the results of the encounter on your own. Fort Hagen was, for a lack of a better way to put it, an absolute nightmare. The abundance of close quarter combat scenarios in small rooms and narrow corridors made it feel like I was playing Mario Party with the amount I was rotating the joystick. Since aren't really all that tough as of yet, seeing how their limbs can be knocked off if any of them managed to survive more than a few strikes, chances were they would end up losing their arms during the engagement. When it was time to face down Kellogg, I just charged him right off the bat and tossed him aside just like I did with Skinny Malone. This of course didn't kill him, but it took him out of the fight for a moment while I focused on his backup. Once they were down, I turned back to Kellogg and got a few swings in before he made the smartest play he's ever done for me and retreated back into the previous room, almost as if he knew I would have trouble getting to him. 
Unlucky for him, I have mastered the spin technique by this point and was able to effortlessly make my way to him, and although he was trying to back into the next room, he wasn't quite fast enough and I managed to catch him with the running power attack, ending the fight. I then grabbed my rewards, briefly watched the Prudwin, and then made my way to Good Neighbor where I made a grand entrance by launching Finn into orbit for all to see. The Memory Den segment is no different as far as I could tell, just the same as usual, so once I was out, I made my way for the Glowing Sea. I came across another set of super mutants, this time however all of them valued their life, so I didn't have to worry about being sent into a non-consensual blaze of glory. Next I was greeted by a few rad scorpions, who from what I could tell, couldn't actually damage me in any way. Speaking of things that cannot harm me, it should probably come as no surprise, but I am completely immune to any and all forms of radiation. With this knowledge I went and had my fun with the Children of Adam, this is because all these months later I am still salty for how much they charge me for those damn Gamma Gun rounds. Outside of Virgil's cave I am usually greeted by a legendary death claw on these runs, and seeing how I was on very hard, I thought it would be almost guaranteed. But not this time I'm afraid, in fact it was just a normal death claw much like myself with no special abilities. To that end it is no more difficult than the one I faced off against earlier in Concord, and just like the death claw before him, he also gets reduced to bite sized pieces. One rad conversation with Virgil later and it's back to my favourite thing in this run, cramped hallways based combat. Wonderful. The gunners and their turrets actually pack quite a punch, to the point where I have to be very cautious when taking them on, especially if they greatly outnumber me. What this ends up meaning is there's a lot of stop and go in the green tech building as after just about every encounter I have to wait around for my health to come back. It takes a bit but I managed to make my way through to the courser, and as for the fight, well I'm just going to show you the whole thing. Me? I'm here to kill you and take what's inside your head. That you cannot have. As amazing as this was, it led to a separate issue as he fell in behind this locked door that couldn't be opened without a master level in computer whiz. All hope wasn't lost as while I was trying to grab the chip from him, I noticed I was slightly facing through the door, and wouldn't you know it, with enough wiggling I was able to clip right past it. I could then pick up the chip, clip straight back, and head straight to get it decoded at the railroad. And by get it decoded, I of course mean I murder the railroad in cold blood and decode the chip myself, as it is much faster than listening to Tinker Tom ramble on. With the decoded chip now in my possession, all that remained was to put it to good use and build the teleporter. Considering what I just did to the railroad and the fact Preston still wants nothing to do with this playthrough, that quite literally leaves only the Brotherhood. Thanks to mine and Dan's previous adventures, I can just head straight to the Pridwin. All I would need to do is board the Vertibird and... Oh no! The good news is this doesn't crash the game and I can acquaint myself with the rest of the Brotherhood. The bad news is, I don't think any amount of health regen is going to heal those injuries. After enjoying Max's speech I get my orders to head to Fort Strong, not wanting to become one with the Vertibird's minigun yet again, I opt to just run there instead. The super mutants at the fort greatly outnumber me, plus they have a behemoth, yet I still thought rushing in claws first was a good idea. It wasn't. Next try and I begin by thinning out the herd as I go after the weaker mutants first, all the while circling around the destroyed building in the centre so that the behemoth couldn't sneak up on me. The behemoth honestly wasn't really what I was worried about as just like Swan I could probably stun lock him to death when it came to a one on one scenario. The real issue was a legendary super mutant who was pretty resistant all things considered and he could do a great deal of damage in a short amount of time. That being said, once I took out his backup and managed to gain some distance from the big one, he was able to be picked off within just a few hit and runs. Like with any encounter indoors, the hardest part was just squeezing past the doorways as opposed to actually fighting what was inside. Once the fort was cleared I got to building the teleporter, and thanks to a small shopping spree earlier, I didn't need to worry about looking for any of the materials. This image right here got me thinking though, maybe just teleporting a bunch of death claws into the institute would actually have been a pretty effective way of wiping them out. Inside I meet up with Sean and I'm a little saddened that he isn't just an egg with death claw legs sticking out of it. My disappointment aside however, I figured this would actually be one of the best playthroughs for me to side with the institute. The sole reason being, the Institute's final mission takes place in a nice wide open area, which would certainly be a nice change of pace for this run. After conversing with the leaders, it's off to the Libertalia to bring in a rogue synth. I was initially concerned about just how I'd make my way up the narrow walkways to where the synth is, but something I haven't really brought attention to yet is that I can still jump as a Deathclaw. This is important because you jump relative to your own height, so I can kind of just bypass the majority of the climb this way. After I use the recall codes on Gabriel, I quickly take out his last two men. And let's just say I'm pretty glad Gabriel's lowering his head at the moment, as otherwise this claw swipe may have taken it straight off. Next was the Battle of Bunker Hill, and I may have gone a little overboard with the whole killing thing, as it wasn't just the Railroad and the Brotherhood I went after, Old Man Stockton and his traitors also didn't live to see another day. 
I had to turn back into a human again as there was another destroyed wall that I couldn't fit my Deathclaw form through, which still sucks by the way. Facing off against the Brotherhood is actually quite fun as a Deathclaw. There is something incredibly satisfying about being able to pull off the same takedown that the Deathclaw on Concord has done to every player so many times. After the Brotherhood and Railroad are out of the picture, I recall the synths, climb my way up the CIT ruins, watch his father turns to the dark side, and somehow get put forward as the next director. It's time for mass fusion now, and to be honest, it was a lot easier than I was anticipating. Sure, the Brotherhood still hurt, but the fact I can toss around even the ones in power armor means I can just prioritize the biggest threats to me and make sure I knock them down with the takedowns. Retrieving the Agitator was also a piece of cake thanks to the aforementioned immunity to radiation. I thought that maybe the Sentry Bot and the Saltrons would give me trouble, and that initially seemed to be the case as the Sentry Bot just kept slapping me repeatedly. But if that strategy can work on me, then you can be damn well sure it also works on him, so a few more slaps on my end and he's toast. The Assaultrons were able to block a few of my swings, but in the end I didn't give them enough time to charge up their Death Star lasers and as such emerged victorious. Back yet again to the migraine inducing walls of the Institute, and this time I needed to persuade a scientist by the name of Wallace to join our underground clubhouse. We all know by now just how much of a smooth talker Florence the Deathclaw is, so this went by pretty quick. I put my vocals to use yet again as I made my speech to the Commonwealth, and somehow managed to fit inside Travis's radio station to mess around with the buttons to make it work. All this leaves is the last two quests to get rid of the Railroad and Brotherhood, and to my surprise, unlike when siding with the Brotherhood of Steel, if you've actually previously wiped out the leaders of the Railroad, Father just congratulates you on a job well done, rather than send you back to the church. So I guess all that leaves is actually assaulting the airport, and to get my first attempt out of the way right now, I sprinted straight to the main entrance and got absolutely demolished by their forces. Next attempt, I played things a bit more stealthily, or at least as stealthily as you can be as a 10 foot death lizard, as I went round the side and picked them off slowly one at a time, only popping out to take who I could, and then retreating to heal when necessary until I could make my way and destroy the first generator to bring in the synths. The synths aren't great here at actually fighting back against the Brotherhood. Case in point, look at this one they sent me with no arms. However, they can act as pretty effective distractions while I'm off trying to heal, as they never seem to stop spawning. After the last generator is down, I was expecting the fight of my life when defending the synths hacking Liberty Prime, but because the Brotherhood is more focused on taking out those synths, I can kind of just attack and kill whoever I need, and then if my health gets slow, I can once again just move away from Liberty Prime, and they usually won't follow me. I managed to personally take out Dance and Reese during the battle, but I never once saw Elder Maxim. Although at one point right before the virus was uploaded, when I was minding my own business, a random vertebrate kamikaze itself into me. I never actually did find the bodies of the Brotherhood who were inside this vertebrate, so I'm choosing to believe it was Maxon, feeling to make a heroic sacrifice. After this, the Brotherhood's reinforcements kind of just stopped, letting us upload the virus, and then we all enjoyed the fireworks together on a nearby beach. All that's left now is Nuclear Family, which just has me talk to Father before he dies, but I chose to remind him that he shouldn't have let a wild animal into his base, finishing the game, and proving no, I could not beat Fallout 4 as a Deathclaw. The run may not have been a success in the end, but that's not to say I didn't have a great time recording it. It was a lot of fun to experience the game in a completely new way than what I'm used to. I know there's loads of mods out there that let you play as other creatures and robots, so if that's something people want to see, I would happily try them out in the future. Regardless, that's going to be in this challenge video. If you enjoyed it, saw, consider giving it a video like and you're interested in more challenges in the future. Feel free to subscribe to one of these videos out every week. My name is Norbert, I'll see you all in the next video.